Yep. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, looks like we are congregation light today. Uh, Thank you. Remind, it reminds me a little bit of the Sunday that I didn't know we already knew about COVID. And I looked out and saw, oh, there's about 20 people missing that are usually here. So if you'll notice around you, um, who are some people that usually sit next to you and aren't there? Uh, see about get, uh, getting their number and giving them a call or uh, send them a car or something like that that you were that you missed them. Um, part of it is the other half of the big family of children over here, right? <laughs> two, two families of children. So, uh, but I, I did see that there's a familiar face back uh, and on the left side, Beverly, and, <laughs> and an unfamiliar face to me. Beverly, would you like to introduce your daughter to us? Yes, this is uh, our daughter, Heather. Today's Jerry's birthday. Today's Jerry's birthday. Happy oh, birthday so. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jerry. Happy birthday to you. And many more. <laughs> <laughs> so y'all came especially to give him a hard time this morning. Okay, so is he, is he old or very old now? 74. 74, he proudly states. Okay. He's very young, a second child. Still very young. Okay. Just a kid. Okay. Uh, you may have noticed on your way in that there's an orange sign out front uh, and that is a, an invitation to the community that we're going to be having trunk and treat. Uh, this uh, this month, and you can find details about that in the bulletin. Uh, an encouragement for donations for candy. Uh, if some people are not going to plan to decorate the trunk of their car, well, first let me ask: Is there anybody here that doesn't know how trunk and treat works? Anybody that doesn't know how that works? All right, so it's oh, okay. Good. There's somebody. Um, on, on the day, we'll come and we'll decor, uh, do a, a pattern over in the uh, area across the road. Uh, I don't know, last time I think it was a half circle with the trunk towards the center, and then you decorate your trunk. And it can be autumn themes, it can be Halloween themes. I do try to encourage that whenever we are dealing with Halloween and a celebration, that uh, we remember that there's a, a day in that week that is All Saints Day, and since we're followers of Jesus Christ and He gives new life, uh, try to celebrate the things that have to do with life in Christ, or life, good things about life, rather than celebrating death. That's an encouragement from your pastor. And so, uh, now, it is fun to have uh, creepy things with spider webs and things like that, and whatever, whatever you would like to do, there's not going to be a judgment against you from me. But I would encourage that as a church, we try to focus on uh, the, the, the good things that God has given. Um, so, but anyway, the decoration of our cars, and we give out candy as the kids come, and it's a way to be able to go, uh, go out and enjoy that in a church community. Uh, also, there are folks that can do little games at the back of the car, and we have some of those uh, materials for having games, like, uh, it seems like I remember one of them has to do with catching ducks or fish out of the water. No? <laughs> yeah, I, I, remember. I remember that. Uh, and, and other things like that, even tossing the sandbags and things. So it's just a little, it's an opportunity to be able to have that fun. If you'd like to give donations to candy, um, you're welcome to do that, bring it by the office, and that will be spread out to the different people that are doing that. You can bring your own candy, you're encouraged to bring your own candy, um, make sure it's the stuff that comes professionally wrapped, uh, and, uh, and have it from the back of your car as well. All right, any other announcements that I need to speak aloud that need more emphasis than the fact that they're already written down for you? Just yes, sir. 
Methodist men is Thursday morning. Okay, there's a shift in the usual day of the Methodist men. It's going to be this Thursday morning right. coming up. Okay, all right, and uh, the, for the breakfast, the men's breakfast. Yeah. All right, we continue to have uh, a, a men's coffee time. Breakfast is optional early in the morning on Tuesday at Panera Bread and on Wednesday at McDonald's. Uh, and right now, that's just a handful of men that, that will come out and visit, uh, talk about life in general and, and the problems of the world, and then we talk about the solution to all the problems of the world. And that's the Word of God and a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. So we have opportunities to share uh, scripturally. And uh, since some of us have loud voices, people around us notice and sometimes come over and talk to us and sit down. Some have started sitting down with us, and we're seeing a little bit of change in their, in their attitudes and such. So it's an outreach ministry. You're welcome to join us. Um, 7 o'clock at Panera Bread uh, on the other side of Brooksville, or 7 o'clock, that's Tuesday, 7 o'clock on Wednesday uh, at the McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's a thing of a ministry of men to men, but women stop in and, and get prayer for, from us and talk with us too. So if any of you want to come sometimes and uh, be a guest at the little tiny men's gathering for conversation and prayer that year, you would not be chased away. You didn't say what time. 7 o'clock. Well, okay, the men's breakfast on this Thursday is at 9, nine o'clock here. So the breakfast here is 9 o'clock Thursday. Um, Tuesday and Wednesday, it's at 7 o'clock, Panera and McDonald's. The ladies have a Bible study on Friday. I don't want to be acting like the men are the only thing. You know, they have a Bible study on Friday, and on Thursday at 10, 10. is uh, when they have their crafty time. Right. Um, also, I just want to let you know, keep an eye on your emails, because we got a lot of stuff coming up uh, for updates for what we're going to be doing for the seasons. Um, they are looking right now for people to participate uh, for our Christmas event on December 8th, uh, looking for people who like to sing uh, to join us. We're also looking for people to participate in a live nativity, or if you have animals that you'd like to let us use, that is great. But I'm going to be sending out a lot of stuff out on emails, okay? Our first hymn is just a closer walk with thee. Please join with us. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus sweeps me from all wrongs. I'll be satisfied as long.
guide me gently, safely o'er to thy kingdom shore, to thy shore. Sticks. 
he called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day that the Lord sends rain on the land. The affirmation of faith is the Apostles' Creed found in the middle of your bulletin. If you would stand and join in, it would be greatly appreciated. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Now, as we receive our offering, we will also uh, receive any prayer request cards that you've prepared. You'll just hand those separately to the, the usher rather than setting them in the plate. That makes it easier for him to bring them to me. And uh, as we bring these gifts, remember that we're not only bringing financial gifts for the Lord to use through the church, but we're bringing and recommitting a gift of our time, the talents that God has given us, uh, our service, and, uh, and the use of the spiritual gifts that God offers as well that goes beyond our own abilities. And so, in a sense, we're giving of ourselves. Jesus, my 
and, uh, and other locations into Tel Aviv, the business capital of Israel, and into the, uh, the additional neighborhoods and communities. It's been done before and it's being done again. So we'll have prayer specifically in that. But I'm going to go now, though, to some, some uh, family prayers that are being requested as well. Um, so the family of Tippy Carey, and I don't know anybody, uh, if anyone is familiar with Tippy Carey, but Brenda is asking for prayer uh, because Tippy passed away on Monday, and so the family are experiencing their grief very fresh right now. And uh, Mary Elwin's family mm -hmm. continue to pray for them and uh, Larry's brother's death, Lester. Uh, Larry and Mary are still on the road traveling. Uh, they went, drove up north for the, sim the burial and uh, I'm not sure when they're, come when they're gonna be back. But let's keep them in our prayers in their time of grief. And um, some news, a uh, little bit of it's good news. Brenda is lifting up prayer, uh, giving thanks that uh, Kenny is uh, here in his third round of chemo and he's been feeling pretty good considering the treatments of chemo. He has his days where he gets worn out and he has his days where he has plenty of energy, but uh, she's giving thanks that the chemo treatments are going well. Um, but very much wants your prayers because uh, this is one of those places where chemo might help um, and it might not help and it may extend life but may might not be able to cure the cancers there's a lot of uncertainty there in this stage so would we'll continue to in, a, ask for our prayers father I do lift up to you Laura's family there at Tel Aviv at the University and I lift up to you uh, specifically the Carey family and uh, the Elwins and I also lift up uh, the family that for whom we had a memorial service yesterday and uh, I was remembering his name Gilbert Gilbert uh, Gilbert's family uh, we found them to be a wonderful group of people and enjoyed them being here. A lot of you would remember Gilbert from some years ago and his wife Carmen and uh, when they were very active in the church here. So our prayers continue to go out to them. Father, we ask that as we lift up these prayers for specific things and, and uh, bring to mind some of our own personal needs in our family and uh, relationships and finances and health issues and things, our hearts go out to your people in Israel. We thank, we, we pray for those in Tel Aviv that are uh, Jews and Christians and Muslims because there are many who live together in peace there in the city of Tel Aviv and enjoy prosperity with their businesses. There are many of each of those ethnic and religious groups uh, in Israel, throughout the nation, that live in peace and harmony and just want to be able to go to work each day and make a living and have a life with their family and with their neighbors. There are many who seek your peace there, Lord. And so we pray for those under attack in Israel. We also pray for those who live on the outskirts where the attack is coming from because we know from experience, Father, that, that cannons and mortars and rockets are fired from neighborhood areas. And uh, so when the battle takes place to try to protect the cities in Israel, there are innocent people who are at risk as well, who may not know that there were rockets set up behind their homes and, and in uh, behind their businesses and near their schools. And so then, when in retaliation, there's that danger. Well, I pray, Father, that you would move the innocent people away from 
the danger. And though there's, there's not very far that you can go away uh, in Israel to get out of the, uh, the range of weapons from possible enemies, but Lord, we ask your protection upon those who would seek your peace, that would seek your way, and uh, ask, Father, that you would change the hearts of those who seek war, and those that will, uh, on, on both sides, and those that will not seek your peace, we, I pray that you would just remove them from influence. What takes place there in that region will have a, a devastating, could have a devastating effect around the world. It could ex accelerate into a much greater war between many nations. So I ask, Father, that you would bring reason and rational thought for those that don't tend to have such. We ask these things in humility, Father. We ask knowing that we don't know everything and we don't, we don't have the solutions, but we ask for you to bring the solution. We thank you for the peace that we have enjoyed uh, for some decades now. But, and, and so now we ask that you would bring it back once again. I pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Our Lord. Amen. I think I'd like to have us sing the hymn and uh, we'll say the Lord's Prayer after the prayer for the pastor today. Thank you. It's blessed by this as well, that the oil and the flour never run out and God blesses others through that. Does God cause the boy to die. We see that he got sick and he died. He stopped breathing. That's as simple as it said. And I think about that during a time of famine, there's usually also disease. Our resistance goes down when we have very little to eat. And disease gets spread. But the boy got sick and he stopped breathing. And the woman cried out to God's servant and to God, and she asked a reasonable question. What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? You see, she's remembering her own sin. She's wondering if the death of her son, after everything looked so good, was because of whatever her own sin was. But Elijah took the child from her arms and took him up into the room that he was staying at her house, and he cried out to God. You have the details there. So does God cause the boy to die? I don't think so. I think the boy died because of the conditions of famine, as so many people do. And God allowed him to die, but God had it in his plan to give him life again. And Elijah prayed and three times spread out across his body asking God to heal him. You see, God doesn't cause people to die out of spite and God doesn't make it stop raining out of spite. Because we know from scriptures that God is the one who provides rain. Otherwise, we wouldn't have rain. And we see from this story that God is the one who provides life. The boy stopped breathing, and God breathed life back into him. There are reasons and occasions when God doesn't send the rain. There are reasons and, and occasions when that God doesn't give life or renew life. But it, it's because of the brokenness of the world that we have death. It's because of the decisions of man and woman that we have death. So Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house, and he gave him to his mother. 
and said, Look, your son is alive. And then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know, this sounds familiar, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. The word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. Sometimes we have to go through very difficult times. Sometimes, uh, even like this woman, someone who knows God and believes in God and just accepts the suffering that she's going to accept and accepts the death that she's going to face, but she still knows that God is God. Sometimes we have to go through the terrible things. But God is still there. And God has a plan. And the plan is redemption. All that took place was to redeem and, and to bring Israel back to God. All that takes place in our lives is to bring us closer and closer to our Heavenly Father. Please pray with me. Father, I thank you that right now life is really good. We've been reminded this month with a couple of funerals here in our church that life does end and, and go into death, but it may rise up a new life in life eternal. Help us to remember, Lord, that you are always with us. You always have a plan for us. And as you carry us through the struggles and problems of life, sometimes that are caused by other people, sometimes caused by ourselves, sometimes just a part of this broken world, that you are with us and you have a plan for us. And you just might use us in some pretty fantastic ways. Keep us always faithful, Lord, and asking, what do you want to do next? And how are you going to make it happen? I pray these in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Okay.
I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our third scripture reading is from John, chapter 16, verses 25 through 33. Jesus said, Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have someone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you now believe, Jesus replied? A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. God's word for his people, true in the past, true in the present, and will be true in the future. It's now my uh, pleasure to pray for our pastor before we hear the sermon that God has inspired in him. Please bow your heads with me. Father God, we are so lucky to be here today worshiping. We're so happy that uh, so many have come to join with us today in our worship with you. Please be with our pastor as he brings the message that you have laid upon his heart and mind this week and that he has prepared. Please, Lord. Give him clarity so that what he tells us, we can wrap our mind around, take it into our heart, and take it out into this community this week to our friends, our family, perfect strangers that we may meet. We ask all your blessings on him and his family, Lord, and on this church. In Jesus' name we pray. I wonder if uh, I wonder if it is as I don't know confusing or uh, not so obvious to you as it's not so obvious to me as to why here in verse 29, 30, when Jesus, as he's been talking with the disciples, and we we've known that again and again. The disciples would say to Jesus, um, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? And uh, on many of those times, I can see why they're asking, what do you mean by that? It's, it can be difficult for us to understand. What is Jesus talking about here? What, what does that story have to do with the problems that are going on? But as, as we read them and as we, we prayerfully consider all of Jesus' teachings over time, 
they begin to be more and more clear for us. Particularly if we do study from the Old Testament as well. Because so often Jesus, the things Jesus would say have something to do with very familiar passages to the, uh, uh, the, the Jewish person that had been raised in the synagogue and had uh, committed to their memory these stories of the Old Testament and the meanings of what took place. But here in verse 29, Jesus said to his disciples, Now you are speaking clearly. Excuse me, I'm in the wrong place. Pick it up here and hold it closer to my eyes. Uh, Jesus had said to them in verse uh, 27, at, uh, ver middle of verse 26, I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and, ha and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. So now the disciples say, Now you are speaking clearly and without figurative speech. But when I read that, I, I, I think, How is it that they're suddenly saying, Oh, no, that's clear. When other things that I don't, I don't see the difference, really on how it's suddenly that he's speaking clearly and sp instead of speaking uh, in parables and such. But in thinking about it a little bit further, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and back up to the beginning of the reading. And uh, we'll break it down just a little bit as to what might be the reason that we can find here in the passage as to why the disciples are suddenly saying, now you're speaking clearly. So in verse 25, Jesus says these words, Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day you will ask in my name. You see, many people in, in that time that were listening to Jesus didn't understand much of what he was saying. In fact, I think most of the people who were listening to Jesus didn't understand much of what he was saying. When we compare to the thousands that were there like, uh, for the Sermon of the Mount and at the, at the 5,000 men plus women and children when he fed the multitudes uh, with just a few lo loaves of bread and, and pieces of fish and uh, and then another time he fed 4,000 uh, men plus women and children. Uh, so many people came out to hear what he had to say. But comparatively, not so many were following him everywhere he went. There were those who believed about him. There were those who believed the things that he said but they were not yet ready to follow him. Now we're told about early in the ministry when he specifically called 12 different people in a close period of time. It was over a, a, apparently a few days, but from here and from here and from here, he specifically said, stop what you're doing and follow me. And they did. And we think of the 12 disciples. Uh, but then we see that later on there's 70 and 72 who he sent out of his disciples to go out and to proclaim the, the messages that Jesus had been teaching. Then we learn later on that there were 120 of his disciples gathered together in one place as he was teaching them separate from the masses. And so we see that the numbers are growing of those who say, I want to learn from you, the Master. I want to follow in your way. After the resurrection, we learn of even more. But between those times of, of the increase and, uh, and then the large increase in numbers who believe after the resurrection, 
we do see that there are some who left Jesus because this teaching or that teaching was it's just too difficult. And they turned away. And Jesus told them, the, the others that many will turn away because his teachings are difficult. So often people didn't understand, and there were times that uh, clearly the disciples didn't understand as well. And so now he's saying there's going to come a time that I'm going to speak more clear, clearly. I think that the reason that it was difficult then and why it is difficult today for us to understand clearly Jesus' teachings is because it's difficult for us to put aside our preconceived ideas, our preconceived uh, desires, and our expectations of, of what we want God to be like and, and of what we want His answers to be to us when we pray. And uh, just like in that day, the preconceived Im image that many people had of the Messiah, and when they started thinking, oh, maybe this is the Messiah, which, you know, they would said maybe this is the Messiah a lot of times, okay? And maybe this is the Messiah. Many of them expected that he was going to gather up the people, and then there would be a physical revolt to kick out the Romans and to reestablish Israel as an independent nation again. And there were people who expected that, and anything that Jesus taught that didn't fit with that, they didn't, they didn't grasp, they didn't understand. And anything that he taught that seemed to me maybe going in that way, they said, okay, this is what I'm in for. And so this is the reason that there were those who came to hear him but didn't follow, and there were those who decided to follow him and then turned away. But this second paragraph is pretty significant. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. Well, let me start in verse 26. In that day, you will ask in my name. In that day, you will ask in my name. There's going to come a time when uh, I'm speaking clearly and will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you. That's an unfamiliar statement for most of the people in Jesus' day. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. So it's an incredible thing to comprehend that God the Father loves you specifically. Now, I, I knew that since I was a child because we sang, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me, so we sang those songs. I heard plenty of sermons that told me about God's love for me. And uh, my, my parents demonstrated to me through words and through actions that God loves me. But then there came a point where I began to realize that some of my attitudes and some of my behaviors and, and some of what I want didn't fit with God's way. And I began to wonder how can he love me if I'm not being obedient to him. Because there's plenty in the scriptures that tells us that obedience to God is important and it, it, has, a, it has an effect on our lives. So he has loved me, even me. But Jesus says, I came from the Father. He says, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God, this is why the Father loves you. And what he's emphasizing for us is that uh, he's loved me even before I loved him. But when I love him, I desire to know him. I have to want to know the Lord. I want to know the Lord's way. I want to follow in his way. And desiring that will bring it about in my life. Not because of my power, but because of God's power. When I ask him, when I asked him as a child, I want to be like that. When I hear the story of the heroes of the Bible, I want to be like that. 
When I'd hear the way that Jesus said that we should live our lives, and as a child I'd think, I want to be like that. The desire to be like that, to love the Lord and to love His way, and specifically Jesus, opens us up to become like that. Because we ask God to work in me. At eight years old, when I heard the testimony of other Christian men at the Methodist Men's Retreat, and I heard how God changed their lives drastically when they gave their life over to Jesus. Two different men were giving their testimony on that weekend. And I, my, my thought in my mind at the time when, they, when the invitation was given for us to go forward and give our life to Jesus, my thought was, I want you to work in my life like that. And so I went forward. It's the desire to have God work in our lives the way that Jesus tells us about in the scriptures that opens us up to receive the gift that he offers. In verse 29, then Jesus' disciples said, now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. Now, I remember having read other places in the Gospels where Jesus knew their hearts when he said something and they grumbled to themselves and not loud enough for him to hear, but he knew their hearts. And so that he spoke to the issue, he spoke to the problem. And that had to be kind of freaky to all of a sudden have Jesus look at you back there in the back crowd when you're just thinking, I don't like what he's saying. And he says, I know that you don't like what I'm saying. You know our heart and minds when we ask wrong, and you know our hearts and minds when we ask right. That's what we need to understand about Jesus. That's what we need to understand about the Father, because when we know the, the Son, we know the Father. When we see Jesus, we see the Father. And we need to understand that he loves us, even, even me, even with the things that I've messed up. And I can ask him, and he knows my heart and he knows my mind, and if I'm asking him for his will to be done in my life in any situation, he will. But when I go to him with my preconceived idea and I think, you know what I think would be best for me would be this, would you do this for me? If it's not best for me, and then he'll say, I've got a better way. And he'll do something different. In my experience, Jesus has said to me a, a number of times, or my Heavenly Father. Sometimes I pray to God to the person of Jesus. Sometimes I pray to God, my Heavenly Father. After all, that's what he said for us to do. Sometimes I call out to the Holy Spirit. But I know it's the one God. And when I do... I ask him for what I think I need, and I say, just like Jesus did. But I don't understand it all, that's what I say, but your will be done, that's what Jesus says. Because I might not be asking correctly, and a lot of the times God says, yes, I will, but not yet. Yes, I will, but not yet. And I know he will, and I just wonder, why not yet? Why not yet? In verse 31, do you now believe? Jesus says. He said, now we believe. It makes us believe that you came from God because you know without us even having to ask you the questions, you know the questions on our hearts and you give us the answers and now you speak clearly to us that you came from the Father and now you're going to go back to the Father. That's what you're talking about. We get it. So somehow they had their aha moment but then after their aha moment, Jesus says, do you now believe? He asks a question. I think it's along the line of, really? You think you believe? You think you understand it all? You think you're there? Because his response in verse 32, a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered. You believe a little bit, but you don't believe enough. When it comes down to a crisis, you're going to all scatter and disappear to your own houses because you don't believe enough. 
But he says, each of you to your own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I think Jesus is pointing out to them before it happens, you still understand only a little bit. You still believe only a little bit. But in verse 33, as he tells us that we're still going to struggle, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Now he's telling them that because pretty soon they're not going to have any peace. Their life's going to be turned upside down. But he's letting them know, in me, you will have peace. In the world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world. And even though we still have struggles in the world, he is there with us through his Holy Spirit. And even though we have a little bit of belief now and a little bit of understanding now, and then we realize I'm still struggling with some of it, it's going to get better. It's going to get stronger. I want to tie in just a little bit to the Old Testament readings. It was a... For, uh, uh, it, like so many other Old Testament passages, are foundational passages for things that Jesus teaches about. And going back and looking at what God had already said about the same subject can often be very helpful to us. I want to look a little bit at, at Elijah's faith and this woman's faith. God sent Elijah to talk to Ahab, the king. And his message to Ahab, the king, was, As the Lord... The God of Israel lives, whom I serve. There will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except by my word. You've heard the, uh, the saying, uh, don't kill the messenger. That's a saying that messengers came up with. It's along the lines of, um, King, I know you're not going to like this, but I'm, it's not me saying it. This is a message from God, so don't kill me. You know? But he had to go to, to Ahab and tell him this message. God is, has been very displeased with you as the king and with the people of Israel. You've been worshiping other gods. I've sent prophet after prophet, and you don't listen to them. And so now I'm going to get your attention. It's not going to rain for a few years. There won't even be dew on the ground for a few years. Now, no rain will mean eventually it's going to be hard to find water. But there will be places where people will be able to find water. But not enough water or uh, water that they can access to water the crops. So it definitely means there's going to be a, uh, a problem of no food. Elijah may have expected that he would have been killed by the king, but he went and gave the message anyway, hoping God would protect him. Then he gives this message, and I think that he probably was expecting, this is the land I live in, I guess I'm going to starve with everybody else when the famine comes. I'm going to be struggling. I don't know what I'll do. But he must have been concerned about starvation because he believed that the word of God was true and he was delivering the word of God. He knew it was going to happen, but he wasn't sure what was going to happen to him. God didn't tell him anything about what was going to happen to him. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth ravine. Oh, good. When things get bad, the king's not going to kill me. He's not, and the other people aren't going to kill me because everybody knows I came and said it was going to happen. So he gives him a hiding place. And he says, you will drink from the brook. He's telling me where I'm going to have water. So even if we're starving, I'll have water. I'll, that'll be good. And God says, I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. That is great. 
God's taking care of me. So wait a minute. The ravens, well, they eat dead stuff. You know, uh, when the vultures show up, well, the, the ravens and the crows, they show up too. They, they like to clean up the carrion. So are they going to be bringing me some of that stuff out? It's better than starving to death, I guess. Now, am I going to just open my mouth and they're going to drop stuff in my mouth? They're, they're going to bring me food. I've got a nice brook, but they're going to bring me food. Okay. I don't know how that's going to work out, but uh, let's see. So he did what the Lord told him, and the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And I'm thinking that ravens didn't cook the bread. So I guess the ravens are flying into somebody's window and snatching bread off the table and bringing it to him. This house and that house and another house. Kind of like the seagulls on the beach. You ever take a picnic down to the beach with the sea seagulls? Oh, it's fun to watch them when people, they come out and they, the seagulls know what Publix grocery bags look like. <laughs> Okay, so this crowd comes down with a public grocery bag. They put down a sheet. They set the bags there in the middle of the sheet. And everybody runs out to the water. And the seagulls come in. And just rip the stuff a piece. And they're flying off with pieces of chicken out of the box. And trying to dr drag a bag away. Or you could be real careful and hold it close. I had a time where I had my big hat on for the shade. And I had my sandwich here in my hand. I was eating while I was doing some work. And all of a sudden, my sandwich went from here to here. The seagull knocked off my hat and my sunglasses and took the sandwich out of my hand. So I guess the ravens were coming in and snatching nice little loaves of bread off of the uh, dining table uh, when they came out of the oven and were cooling there. Kind of like stealing a pie from the windowsill. Uh, and they brought meat. Now, it may have been... It may have been animals they found here and there, and he cooked them and everything. It may have been pieces of meat that they snatched from the marketplace. I don't know. It's not specific. But it does sound a lot better than I had imagined. And so he had something to eat. But verse 7, later the brook dried up. So I see Elijah saying what I would say. Now what, Lord? It was a nice running fresh brook, and then it got to a trickle, and then now it's just this became this pond, and then the pond has got muddy, and I have to be careful to get the just get the water, and now it's dry. So now what? And then God gave him a new adventure to go to a widow's house who had a little boy. So I guess she was a young widow without a husband, a little boy. And he goes there and uh he asks her to bring him some bread. As God said, I've prepared a woman to be able to feed you. And uh, she tells him, well, I only have enough flour to make a little tiny, and oil to make a little tiny loaf that I'm going to cook for my son. I'm just gathering these sticks to do the small fire. We're going to cook that and share that together, and then we're going to die. She's got it worked out. But somehow... I see there in verse 12 that her words, when I think, why would she, why would she prepare for him? When he came to the town gate, a widow there was gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? And she was going to get it, and he called, and, and please bring me, please, a, a piece of bread. Now she said some words that I think are important. As surely as the Lord your God lives. If you'll remember, Elijah said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives. I think God's tying this together with her to say these words. And she puts her reliance upon God and she says, As surely as the Lord your God lives, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour, in a jar, and a little bit of olive oil. I think she's saying, God is my witness, this is all I have. But she's acknowledging God here. And then she says, when Elijah says, don't be afraid. How many times do you hear God or his angels say, don't be afraid, in the Bible? 
a lot. I hope that when things get really bad, I'll hear his words saying, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from, the, from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. He's calling for a little bit of more faith than she already has. But she decides somehow that she'll do that. And she goes and makes the bread uh, to bring to him. But he says to her, after he says, then make something for yourself and your son, he says a little bit of word of encouragement. For this is what the Lord, the, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on this land. <coughs> and so I think that the woman must be thinking, he's my God too. Elijah has come to recognize God is taking care of me and Elijah is telling her God is going to take care of you and your son. And in fact, it says that the, that the woman and her family have uh, food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. Now that's plural. She has a little son and she's a widow. So I guess her extended family, it must be her extended family,